In this episode, I'll talk about beginner's luck, beginner's mind, the scale of competence, and how confidence can actually be overrated. All of this is inspired by a couple of days with <laughs> of me in the kitchen making macarons for the first and the second time. When I go in the kitchen, interesting things often come out. Hopefully, this podcast is one of them. So here we go. Episode 115, Confidence is Overrated. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony. Because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. So you might think that it's a really strange thing for me to say that confidence is overrated. If you know me, I you know that I'm really focused on helping horses be, com- be confident, about helping students be more confident so they can more independently problem solve and be empowered to you know, train and improve on their own. So I understand that that's a weird thing for me to say about confidence being overrated, but st- stick with me <laughs> and I'll explain why that even came up. So why I decided to do this podcast. So as I said in the introduction, this is all inspired by uh, me going in the kitchen and deciding to challenge myself, which is interesting because, you know, easy things, uh, easy things are challenging (laughs) for me. So, but you know, kind of cooking doesn't interest me unless it's, you know, fancy enough. (laughs) Forget the day to day stuff. So I decided that I wanted to make macarons. Some of you who have been listening to this pod for a while may have remembered in episode 74, uh, I also talk about a a baking experience uh, around eclairs and use that to talk about the power of immersion in order to accelerate learning. So I decided to do the macarons for a a few reasons. One, they're delicious. I really enjoy them. And because I heard that they were really tricky. And uh, based on the length of the descriptions that I found about how to make them, and also the long list of like problems that you need to troubleshoot (laughs) at the end of every recipe, it's like, here's all the things that could go wrong and why they went wrong. And actually, one of the things I noticed about the troubleshooting I would say things like, oh, your macarons are deflated. Either you didn't beat them enough or you beat them eggs too much. I'm like, oh, helpful. (laughs) Not helpful at all. Anyway, so I decided to take it on. And, you know, I kind of, you know, game on, challenge. And, you know, I know that there was so much preparation. Like I had to wipe the bowls down with either lemon juice or vinegar and you had to like separate the egg whites and don't get one drop of yolk in there and you got to let them rest for 24 hours and you have to get them back up to room temperature. Anyway, I I thought, well, this will, this will uh, grab my attention anyway. So for me, cooking has to be fun. Cooking is fun if it grabs my attention enough that it becomes uh, recreational (laughs) and I'm not like thinking of all the other stuff I should be doing while I'm doing it. Anyway, so I had gone to the store, I got the ingredients, I had taken my regular sugar and processed it in the food processor processor to make it like super fine. I had separated my eggs, they rested overnight in the fridge, I had taken them out, they're back up to room temperature, I've got all my ingredients out on the island, you know, like like the people show you on the TV shows. <laughs> like, all right. And Dana came in the kitchen and uh, he's like, so? you know, are you ready? You got this? And I said, oh yeah, it's going to turn out great this first time because I'm not confident. And he kind of looked at me and laughed and then, uh, left the room. And I thought, I thought to myself, that was a really weird thing to hear come out of my mouth. I said, it's, it'll, I know it's going to turn out great this time because I'm not 
confident. And so actually right then I uh, took out my phone and I just, I often write a little note to myself or I'll send an email to myself or do a little voice dictation when I get an idea for a podcast episode. So I took out um, my phone, I did a little uh, dictated an email to myself, (laughs) you know, like what is, what's up with that? It's like confidence is overrated. Why would I get better results because I'm not confident? And the other kind of interesting thing that happened there is like, oh, this wisdom came out of my mouth and it somehow bypassed me (laughs) because I'm like, I don't know if I believe that yet. I was so confident when I said that. So that that's another phenomena that I think is just really cool when you experience that. It's like, who said that? (laughs) That's really deep or I don't even know what to think about that. I'm going to have to like sit down and Google things and take notes. But out that came. I was so sure of myself. It's going to turn out great because I'm not confident. So this is (laughs) the inspiration for the podcast. And I guess, you know, the first thing that I I thought about was um, that I, because I knew nothing I had, I know I had no experience, very low skills in the kitchen in general. And I tend to be a little artistic by nature. So measuring things precisely is not uh, naturally in my wheelhouse. And I like to kind of like jump ahead. (laughs) So going through instructions, you know, perfectly step-by-step is not my favorite thing to do. But I knew because I knew that I knew nothing, I had told myself, like, pay attention. You've got to really pay attention. You've got to really read. Don't just skim. Really read. I read it a few days before. I read it again the day before. I read it again earlier that day. And I was reading it again as I was actually going through the steps. So because I knew nothing... I also knew I needed to pay attention. Now, the other thing about this was my expectations for myself were really, really low. (laughs) So I knew that anything edible that could be recognizable as a macaron would count as a win. (laughs) So I'm not, you know, I'm not a perfectionist. So I'm like, I wasn't thinking it had to be perfect. I'm like, if it is identifiable as a macaron, and when you put it in your mouth, you don't go, (laughs) I'm like, hey, (laughs) I didn't poison anybody. Nobody died. It held together and it was edible. So, you know, it's easier to have success when your expectations are really low. So uh, I think those were the two the two things that I thought right away were reasons why a lack of confidence could actually be helpful. So as I often do, when I start exploring ideas, I thought, well, let me Google confidence. What does it mean to be confident? So the first definition that pops up is that confidence is the state of feeling certain about the truth of something. Like, okay, that makes sense. It's like, I'm sure that this thing is the truth. And, but this, the the way I'm thinking about confidence here, I'm going to go more towards it. it, this, This pot is more about what's in the second definition. So the second definition that pops up is that confidence is a feeling of self assurance rising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities or qualities. So I guess confidence in your ability is not so much about being perfect. It didn't say that confidence in one, you had to have confidence in, in getting perfect results, but you needed to have an appreciation of one's ability. And with that kind of confidence, you're going to end up staying committed to the process of improving 
and then the results will, will be better. You'll get good results. So confidence, you know, I didn't have a feeling of self-assurance of my own abilities or qualities, right? So I didn't have that. So I paid attention more. And as far as that first definition, the state of feeling a certain truth about something, I was actually feeling more confident that it, it probably <laughs> wouldn't work out. So this is where it gets weird. It's like, I was confident that I was not confident. I was confident that I probably couldn't do it. And that's why I think this is so interesting, uh, to see how can, you know, how can you, how can confidence in a lack of ability uh, be helpful. So anyway, so I started swimming around in, in those thoughts and then that caused me to explore a couple other things. And so the next thing that I explored was this idea of beginner's luck. And so I looked at beginner's luck. I looked at beginner's mind and then stages of competence and then this idea of being committed without being attached. So these are all the things that are like swimming around in my mind. I'm like, okay, if I'm not confident, you know, what else, what else was going on here to help me actually be successful? So I looked up beginner's luck and beginner's luck is the, it's described as the supposed phenomenon of novices experiencing disproportionate f frequency of success or succeeding against an expert in a given activity. And so, you know, you're new at this, you shouldn't do really well, but you do, right? So you, you're a novice, but you have um, disproportionate success um, compared to your level of ability. And that's, I think, you know, I was like, well, I'm, I'm having beginner's luck with a Macron. So let me just tell you, the macarons turned out really freaking good. <laughs> they were delicious. So I was thinking, oh, well, I paid attention. I wasn't confident, so I paid attention. And then I had beginner's luck. But why is there such a thing as beginner's luck? And so I think with beginner's luck, there's, there's a disconnect between... Let's see, how was it described um, in Wikipedia? <laughs> Look this up in Wikipedia. With beginners, like there's a disconnect between, quote, the player and the pressure of the game, right? So there was n just about no pressure on myself. I'd already gone, eh, I know nothing. <laughs> if it's just edible and recognizable, um, I'll be good. So that's, that's pretty low pressure. I was taking the pressure off myself and it just did this naturally. It wasn't conscious, but by taking the pressure off yourself, you open yourself up to beginner's luck. Because if you're not expected to do well, there's no pressure to do great. And this lack of pressure is what actually allows you to concentrate more. So kind of counterintuitive, but it works. So um, there's a <laughs> there's a more of a description in Wikipedia and I'm just going to read from Wikipedia because this is, it's, it's kind of a cool idea. So this is a quote. Um, it says the acquisition of a new skill imposes limitations on the number of actions available to an agent in the early stages of this process, an almost unlimited number of actions are possible though almost all of these are ineffectual, the probability of unusually effective actions manifesting by chance is still greater than when one has attained a moderate degree of skill, since as one, one's ability improves, the scope of possible actions becomes both more lawful and more limited subtending freakish deviations from the mean in both directions. These runs of flukish proficiency will stand out against the base rate of general ineptitude. <laughs> you might want to rewind that. But the idea, the idea is when you're new at something, 
there's, what do they say? An almost unlimited number of actions are possible, right? You're new, you try stuff. And then as you get better at something, you get experience and you go, oh, well, when I do this, this happens. So I'm going to keep doing that. And you actually start to narrow your choices. So some of that is necessary, right? We don't want to be flailing around all the time. You want to improve and get efficient. But this beginner luck idea where you have all possible actions and you're taking the pressure off yourself, I guess they found that there's the um, probability of unusually effective actions manifesting by chance is greater than when one has attained a moderate degree of skill. Because as one's ability improves, the scope of possible actions becomes both more lawful and more limited. Now, I think we see this a lot of times in, you know, probably lots of things in life, but in the horse world, you know, you get like narrow focus and then, you know, first you started training all kinds of horses and then you kind of get your niche and your groove. And then any horse that doesn't fit in that particular kind of riding that you do is deemed a problem horse, you know, where somebody new and fresh and curious might explore lots of different options and find that one thing that that particular horse needs. So this explains why often innovation comes from people who are sort of brand new to the game or who don't know, you know, how it's supposed to be done. (laughs) You know, and this, like I said, this happens in the horse world a lot these days, you know, especially now as we're seeing more and more quote unquote non-traditional methods becoming more effective and valuable compared to, um, the, the old school standard professional narrow line in some methods who just keep doing things the same way they've always been done. And so this is, then I started thinking, okay, there's beginner's luck, but how, it, you know, this is different than this idea of the competence scale where, um, where often in the beginning you have unconscious incompetence and and yet there's a high degree of confidence so like the dunning kruger effect so you're this is where you're a beginner at something or a novice at something but you're like hugely com- confident because you're like woohoo i was a mess and now i did this thing and now i'm a rock star and um you're at this beginning stage often there's this unconscious incompetence which is you have no idea how bad you are, right? You have no idea how bad you really are at something, but you feel like a rock star. So it's different because in beginner's luck, you actually do accomplish something really exceptionally good compared to your ability. Where in unconscious incompetence, which is, um, you know, often the first stage, you know, and what's happening, the Dunning-Kruger effect, I think, you know, I'm not an expert, but ballpark, (laughs) you know, you think you're doing something good, but you're really not. You don't have that awareness of like, oh my gosh, really? (laughs) You got so much more to do. So unconscious incompetence is that sort of delightful stage where you think you're doing something amazing and no one around you wants to let you know how bad you really are at it, (laughs) which is good because then you keep going. So back to my macarons, my my first macaron success, and it was very successful. They looked good. They tasted good. They had, they had all the right qualities, you know, again, (laughs) according to me (laughs) and my close friends. Anyway, they were recognizable and they were edible. So they were a huge success, but I think it was a lot about me being free from pressure, low expectation for myself. My curiosity level was quite high, as was my level of focus. And so I think that's what allowed me to um, have the probably beginner's luck. And even though I think, you know, they were a huge success, I also am aware that I'm probably unconsciously incompetent and some um, world-class pastry chef would probably, you know, look down his nose at them and tell me how wrong they were. But for the general public, (laughs) the average person, I think it was a pretty good success. So I was operating, 
I was operating around the macarons in more of the next level of competence, which is conscious incompetence. So I think I feel like I was going in very conscious about my incompetence. And, you know, this conscious incompetence stage is actually where you're really rolling up your sleeves and you're going all through all kinds of trials and tribulations. You're learning, you're, you're acutely aware of everything that's working and not working. And, you know, if we go through that and we keep going at some point you reach conscious competence, right? So you go, okay, I know how to do this and I can avoid these mistakes. I can see them coming. And so I can end up with this higher level skill and I know exactly how I did it. And so the best teachers um, are very aware of the conscious competence stage. They, they were paying attention during the conscious incompetence stage where they're making all the mistakes, but they're noticing them and they're learning from them. So when they get to conscious competence, they can like, they could teach you. They're like, Oh, don't do it like that. This is going to happen. Do it like this. Or, Oh, I see what you're doing here. You might want to adjust. So hopefully if you keep going, then of course the ultimate stage is unconscious competence where it, things are just second nature. You know, those are the people who can, um, measure, you know, do these things that have to be like exact grams, but they can eyeball it, right? They've done enough time. They don't even need the scale anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not ready for that. <laughs> By the way, there's a, we have our web shop in our house and sort of just off the, off the kitchen is a mud room and off the mud room, there's the fulfillment room where we send the orders out. And that was the only place that there was a working scale that had grams, um, on it. So, um, for a little while there was like raw egg and flour and sugar all over the <laughs> the desk. <laughs> and poor Dana came in before I had cleaned it up. He wasn't too happy about that, but it has been cleaned up. Anyway, I digress. Um, okay. So unconscious competence, they, people at this stage may or may not be good at teaching it, depending on how much they paid attention and were aware during the stages before them. So here's the thing with unconscious competence. Once you get there, if you, if you decide to rest there and you don't sort of mind what got you there, it can start slipping away. And because you're unconscious about it, it can start slipping away a little bits at a time. So what's the key, you know, what's the key to keeping it there? What's the key to making progress and then continuing to stay there and keep growing and keep honing your skills and not just have it be so second nature that you, you're not even paying attention to it anymore. And so that's where I started thinking about beginner's mind. So what is beginner mind? Beginner's mind, you can, it's a kind of a Zen and Buddhist sort of concept, but it's the idea where you have an attitude of openness and eagerness and a lack of preconceptions, even when you're studying something that you are advanced at. So that's the tricky part is to you know, gain all that experience. It's easy to have beginner's mind when you are a beginner, right? So my first macarons, I definitely had beginner's mind and beginner's luck. Right? Maybe I had beginner's luck because I had beginner's mind. I knew that I didn't know. And so, um, I had openness, I had eagerness, I had a lack of preconceptions. That's much harder to do when you're already good at it. Now that's the one thing I think, well, one of the many things that I think horses help us with because every horse is different. So the minute you think you know how to do it all, well, a horse will come along to uh, turn on that beginner's mind again, or at least require that it turns on. So maybe you're thinking, okay, this is great, but you know, what about when stuff doesn't work, right? So let's say we can't actually stay at the beginner stage and be okay with, you know, poor results, right? So, um, 
what if we're at the be beginner's mind and we're getting terrible results? You know, that's no good. So if I had, if, if I had a goal to make, you know, top world-class, you know, Michelin star rated macarons and I got, you know, terrible results, that wouldn't be so great. So how do we go through that? Right? So in the beginning I was talking about having low expectations for myself. So, you know, that's kind of, it's easy, right? I set the bar really low, like, yay, Karen, you made something that, you know, was edible. <laughs> so, you know, you can say, yay, I had beginner's luck and I had beginner's mind because I'm just a beginner and look, aren't I cute making this horrible, you know, horrible little cookie. <laughs> but what, you know, what do we do when the results are not good? When we disappoint ourselves? You know, maybe it wasn't edible or maybe, you know, if I raised my expectation and my results didn't meet it, now what do we do? Because I think we have to, you know, can we raise our results? That's the tricky part. And keep the beginner's mind and take and keep the pressure off so we can continue to have that quote unquote luck that comes from being so open and aware so I think that, you know, again, that beginner's mind will help us replicate the beginner's luck sort of concept. But how do we get that higher than beginner results? And this is where uh, a really important um, concept comes into play. I've probably mentioned this a lot. Um, I often um, talk to students about this if they're becoming frustrated or are feeling a lot of pressure. And this is the idea of being committed, but not attached. So when we um, focus on commitment, so no matter what the results we get, you're going to learn and keep going. So to be successful, not everything that you have to do has to be perfect. You just have to keep going. You have to keep learning you have to keep adjusting and keep doing, right? So that commitment is to keep you in the game. You have to be committed but not attached. If you become attached to the outcomes, meaning you emotionally connect your results to your worth, or you judge yourself based on the results, then the likelihood of you stopping or giving up or quitting becomes quite high. So some people, some people, a few can, can use negative self-talk to motivate themselves to take an action. But for the, I think the vast majority of people don't any kind of, um, you know, negative self-talk will tend to stop people. Oh, you're an idiot. I can't believe you did that back. Come on, you can do better next, you know, next time. Or what's wrong with you? Snap out of it. That kind of talk. <laughs> Most of the time that makes people stop. So that's when we're judging ourselves instead of learning from what didn't work and moving on. So committed means commit to the process. No matter what results you get, you're going to learn. You're going to keep going. You're going to adjust. You're going to keep going without being attached, without saying, I'm horrible, useless failure just because my little cookies didn't turn out right <laughs> or whatever it is you're working on. And that's the key to keeping going and getting past um, beginner results from beginner mind or to be able to only have success if you continually lower your expectations. So this is where it's tricky. Like we want to figure out what do we need in the moment to take the pressure off enough to open up possibilities, right? But still have high enough goals that you keep improving and you keep raising your standard, you get better and better and better. So you're raising your level of competence. So I just found this so, I hope you're finding this interesting to kind of, it's just, this is swimming, right? This is definitely not a uh, perfectly scripted podcast, but I'm just sort of swimming in these thoughts. So hopefully you're swimming in them too. So if you're committed to being successful and to practicing the habits that lead to success and at the same time can remain detached to the outcome, you actually will be successful regardless 
of what others do or how the world responds or critiques what you're doing. So commit to being successful. Commit to practicing the habits that lead to success. That's, that's successful. If you practice the process, the results will come. If you focus only on the outcome, then that's often when the pressure comes in and, you know, the emotional piece where you measure your self-worth based on the outcome is more likely to have you stop trying, which will definitely not lead to any further success. So it's commit to the process. And saying that you're successful regardless of what others do or how the world responds, like that's not false positivity. It's not pretending that you didn't get the outcome you were looking for. For this to work, you need to just keep going and adjust and do it again. It's just being real. It's looking at what is not attaching your self-worth to the results. So being committed but not attached is just being able to say, well, that didn't work. <laughs> then keep moving. So let's get back to my macarons. The way I would describe it is the first batch was quite perfect. And yes, you can hear a little bit of the unconscious incompetence and the beginner's luck in there in that statement, right? My first batch was perfect. <laughs> That's how I described them. I was so proud. I put a picture on Instagram of them and everything. The only thing that didn't work so well is the shape of them. I had actually uh, run out of parchment paper. And so I, had to, I took out little cupcake liners and tried to flatten them out. So I had all these little circles of parchment paper. Um, it didn't really work. I mean, I guess if I'd ironed them, maybe they'd work, but I don't iron. So I just kind of smushed them down as much as I could. But because they were kind of lumpy, the the macarons kind of ran a little bit. <laughs> Got a little oval misshapen. Anyway, but because of my low expectations, I still put misshapen macarons was still in my uh, definition of what I could deem as perfect. <laughs> so, um, the next time, the next time that I made them, so a, a week, the next week, I thought, all right, I'm going to make them again. I'm going to like, I'm going to give them to people. Like I was so proud of them. Um, and so I was more confident. I'm like, I can do this. I'm awesome. Look at me, macaron maker. So right off the bat, I made a mistake. I was like, darn, like I didn't even learn from my own podcast notes. So I was super confident. I wasn't paying attention and I made a mistake. I combined the almond flour and the super fine sugar instead of the almond flour and the confectioner sugar. And cause the super fine sugar is supposed to go in the egg whites. So I have a big bucket of uh, the wrong mix and I'll do something with it at some point, I guess. Um, but I had to start over and I had to like make more super fine sugar and measure it all out. And uh, I'm thinking, well, there's the Karen in the kitchen I know so well. But that was my wake up call. So now I was like, oh, there it is. I already like threw out my beginner's mind after one repetition. <laughs> Interesting. So one repetition's worth of confidence was enough to make me make a mistake. Isn't that interesting? So that's why I'm calling this podcast confidence is overrated. So I had to kind of back myself up a little bit and go, okay, remember, Karen, you know nothing. This is only the second time. So I started over. And uh, what's interesting is I really did. I really did try hard. Like I really thought I did everything the same. I was paying attention. I was looking for the soft peaks and then the stiff peaks and, you know, do the whole thing. And I was happier with how they went out on the parchment paper and I was paying more attention for the timing and the oven. Anyway, I, I, after my first mistake, I snapped back into action, but, um, it was interesting because they just weren't as good. Like the tops were cracking more easily when I was trying to do the filling and I don't know the the they didn't stay fluffed up as much as I wanted them to or what the first batch was and I could feel already 
After just the second attempt, I could feel attachment sneaking in. Oh, I'm actually not good at this. That really was just luck the first time. Just beginner's luck, like I'm writing it off, (laughs) like it's not worthy. I'm not good at this. And I was like, wow, Karen, just second try. Very interesting. And so I asked Dana, Dana took a bite. He's like, how are they? And he's like, um, you know, he asked me like, how are they? And I'm like, no, they're, they're terrible. They're not as good. Um, they're not as good as the first batch and blah, blah, blah. Um, but then he, he tried one and he said they tasted just as good as the last ones to him. So anyway, it was interesting that after one repetition, I had raised my standards so high for myself that I went from, oh my God, you're Karen, you're a baking champion to like, oh, I'm bad at this. It's so interesting to do new things and just watch this process. That's why I think it's so important for anybody adult to just like keep trying new things, keep learning because you'll start to notice these processes. I think that become very unconscious when you're doing things that you're used to doing. So because Dana was assuring me that they were still okay, I did take some to my friend Sharon and I was like almost apologizing as I gave them to him. I'm like, well, they're not as good as the first batch. <laughs> Ridiculous. Anyway, she took a bite and she's just like, oh my God. She's like, it's like eating a cloud. She's like, these are better than the ones she got at the World Equestrian Center. And they've got like a fancy French, like patisserie, patisserie, however you say it. Anyway, they have all the fancy pastries. So interesting at how I'm so amazed at how my perception of the result was so dependent on my expectation of myself and my expectation for the results. It's so weird how we can be so good at working through processes in one area of life, but have trouble translating it to the other. So I'm sure I've gone through all these processes with the horses, but I don't remember doing that. Or I just kind of did horses. I'm actually feeling like I'm I'm going through more of those processes consciously now in my life, you know, because I'm at the stage where um, I'm going through a new round of unconscious or a new round of conscious incompetence. (laughs) I'm like, I thought the more experienced you got, you're supposed to be more confident. And I'm like, no, right now I feel like I don't know anything. But now I'm thinking this could be a good thing. Right? It could be a good thing to kind of look at everything with horses with fresh eyes and go, what am I doing? What else could I do better? And not just go bumbling through with, with super high expectations, but not really paying attention. So the macarons maybe will, will even give me better times with my horses. So when, you, when you're good at going through um, processes in one area of your life, that's one of the one way to, to get through to the other side or to improve is to look at, you know, where do you have a process that works and how can you translate that process to another area, right? So how can I take, what did I do with horses to get so good at horses? What did I do? I didn't think about this stuff. I just loved it and paid attention and stayed open and stayed eager. And I can remember like years and years and years and years when I was a kid, I didn't have pressure on myself. I just kept doing it and I made mistakes and I adapted and I kept going. I just made mistakes and I never judged myself. I never judged myself, you know, being attached to the outcomes. I just did stuff. Some worked, some didn't. I kept going. So that's where, you know, if I could just translate that to my baking, right? Instead of after one repetition, putting all this pressure on myself and then judging myself harshly. (laughs) So I think it's easy to translate it. We have to remember to translate it. So with horses, if I've learned anything, it's a, it is a process and it's a long game and daily commitment is the key. So of course, it's going to be the same thing with baking. Why not with anything? So anyway, that's a, it's a lot of talk. I've been talking in circles. I hope this made some kind of sense, uh, but you know, what, what's the takeaway here? What are we, what are we doing? I think the key is to be confident enough to give it a go 
And maybe that's not confidence. Maybe it's courage. And, and actually, maybe it's just curiosity that's the key. Maybe confidence, remember, could be overrated. But be curious enough to give it a go. And confident enough to just adjust it and do it again. Maybe that's not confidence either, though. Maybe that's just humbleness. And enjoy beginner's luck. And use your beginner's mind to turn that luck into conscious competence. Be committed but not attached. Don't be devastated by imperfect outcomes. Be confident in your ability to keep going and practice the skills for achieving excellence regardless of the outcomes. <laughs> 